Thank you for tuning in to Movie Geeks United. The most ardent lovers of cinema often cite Chinatown as the pinnacle of meticulous craftsmanship and uncompromising storytelling, at least in regards to its place in the pantheon of that last golden age of American filmmaking in the early to mid-70s. And if you're a lover of the long-deceased Hollywood that could birth a film like Chinatown, it's likely that you're already familiar with this episode's guest. Sam Wasson is one of the most insightful and inspiring chroniclers of cinema history in recent memory. He's penned books on figures like Paul Mazursky, Blake Edwards, and Bob Fosse. And in his latest book, The Big Goodbye, Chinatown and the Last Years of Hollywood, Sam turns his attention to the cultural influences and oversized personalities that informed this classic film. Our feelings of futility in the grasp of immensely powerful forces, the sense of dread that permeated the Hollywood landscape in the wake of the Manson murders, and the profound contributions of its filmmakers, producer Robert Evans, director Roman Polanski, writer Robert Town, and actor Jack Nicholson among them. Recently, we spoke with Sam about all of this and much more, and here is that conversation. When I think of how movies reflect the culture of the time, I look at the culture, and, and we're in a world at that time where there's tremendous distrust of the government, and yet there are people out there that are very active, and, and they're protesting, and they're getting involved, and yet so many of the great movies of that period seem to essentially be saying, don't get involved. It's better not to get involved. There's this Do as little as possible. Yes. Try, the, they say in Chinatown, yeah. There's a streak of pessimism and... And kind of mm -hmm. nihilism that runs through those films. What do you think that's about? Well, that's about the failure of the '60s, the failure of the of the the, the left to make a a sizable dent in the government, um, as as exemplified by Richard Nixon and the failure of the peace and love movement, the tragic failure of the peace and love movement. Um, the 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 shift from pot to cocaine, in other words, um, the shift from rock to disco, mm. um, and uh, um, it it certainly the upshot of that was that because the country hadn't yet been taken over by conglomerations and and corporate culture, corporate art, there was still a place to express that outrage. Um, and and popular culture benefited from that. Um, the national conversation was elevated by filmmakers who were hip enough to 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 speak um, artfully and truthfully and and be received by a culture because the media hadn't yet been turned into Chinatown. In other words, that the media could broker that communication now um the media is a corporate entity operates like a corporate entity i mean um in the period of the 70s we're talking about uh corporations had purchased the studios paramount had become gulf and western for instance but they were not yet run like corporations mm -hmm. um the movie the the studios were still run like studios uh, which is to say filmmakers were allowed to make films. Uh, and, and that, of course, changed in the mid-70s, and that's part of what my book was about, how Hollywood became Chinatown. And that's still the world we're living in now. Um, Hollywood is most definitely Chinatown, mm. um, if you love movies. How do you read uh, what Chinatown is as a, a metaphor? What what is your take on the, it? The metaphor of Chinatown is a is a state of mind. Uh, uh, I should say it is a state of mind. Yes, but it is a place um, where good intentions die. Uh, Robert Town said it beautifully. He said it represents the futility of good intentions. Chinatown, mm. um, in mm. other words, where you can't have you can't affect any agency where corruption is stronger than your your dream is stronger than truth is stronger than justice um and we're seeing we're seeing a lot of that today um we're seeing a lot of chinatown today and that's one of the reasons i wanted to write the book now um evil evil is always 
evil is always smarter than good. I, I think it, it takes the kind of cunning that good doesn't have. I don't know why that is. I mean, I'm not a philosopher. I, I, I don't know. Maybe it's because it has evil has no scruples. And so there are no strings that's going to that's going to hold evil back. Yeah. Evil will stop at nothing. Right. And maybe good stops at something. Uh, um, finally, um, um, Boy, that's a real cynical <laughs> world view. Uh, I, I, I'm just hearing myself say this for the first time, so I, I could be wrong. You know what's interesting about this and the, the exploring the nature of evil and and that whole notion that that you can make things worse just by getting involved, which is what happens to get us in this movie. Uh, there's something about the detective genre at that time that it was a very kind of genre redefining period of cinema anyway. But you look at movies like Chinatown and The Long Goodbye and Night Moves and how they played with that detective noir genre. Uh, I guess that genre was very malleable at the time uh, because those movies did something very special with it. Well, I mean, if a detective solves the case and puts a happy ending on it, then it's not Chinatown. Um the country had become Chinatown, so you're going to need a befuddled detective like Elliot Gould. You're going to need uh, a deluded detective like Jack Nicholson to express these ideas mm. of of institutional failure and futility. Um, you know, you you can't. You, it it's 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 too late for Perry Mason um, at that at that point. Um, so, I mean, all genres are malleable uh, um, but this is how the detective genre was 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 reinterpreted to to meet the times yeah so tell me a little bit about how this came together and i want to focus on the four major players in this first of all robert town uh it's commonly known as the one of the great screenplays ever written where did this come from for him well, he was a Southern California boy, and um, uh, after the Manson murders, when the city changed overnight, um, he had reason to reflect back on what the city used to be. And so he was inclined towards the nostalgia and, and, um, and memory. Of course, that is... <laughs> It is nostalgia. But he looked back and he said, well, wait a second, what changed here? We used to be, we used to be in paradise, now, now we're in hell. And, and that feeling um, brought him to research California, Southern California, and um, he discovered the story of the Owens Valley Water Wars, and that became for him the basis of, of this detective movie. And then didn't, didn't he actually talk to a detective that worked in Chinatown? Yes, a fellow named Tony Silas. Um, after after the Manson murders, um, um, Town's girlfriend uh, Julie Payne, who would later become his wife, she wanted a gun, and so um, um, Tony Silas was advise, advising them on um, on how to protect themselves, and and um, started chatting with Town. And Town said, well, "You know, what's your beat?" And he said, "Chinatown." And what happens in Chinatown? And he says, well, there's so many dialects and so many different cultures that, you know, we're just advised to just do as little as possible. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it took a few years before town connected that idea to the water wars. Um, in retrospect, obviously, it's, it's, um, it's, 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 it's intuitive, but that's only because, that's only because we have the script. Right. Um, but but that was part of town's thinking to remember back to that conversation with Tony Silas. And what's remarkable remarkable to me is when this script got to Evans, uh, that he that he greenlit it, that he stood behind it, even though it's you know the central premise has something to do with water. How, how exciting could that be? And the fact that no, right. no nobody quite understood the, the script. Right. I, I, I really think that's an important point, and that just goes to show you Evans' faith and talent, mm. which is something that's um, virtually gone from studio filmmaking today. Um, Evans gambled a lot on, on, on his belief that 
uh, Robert Town was a great writer. And he had nothing else to go on except that and, and Jack Nicholson, who was not yet the star that he was today, is today. Um, Roman Polanski had a success with Rosemary's Baby, so that was good, too. But uh, all of that packaged together in a screenplay about Chinatown, which doesn't have a scene set in Chinatown. Um, at that point, it hadn't yet. That that was a later edition. Uh, uh, none of this is none of this makes sense. But but art doesn't make sense. Um, it 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 is mysterious. You cannot make formula art. It requires innovation and originality, and those things are gambles. Mm. And and part of being a great artist or a great producer is allowing for an acceptable amount of originality um, or an unacceptable amount of originality in the case of the bravest artists and producers, um, like, you know, a guy like Francis Ford Coppola. Um, that's real filmmaking. That's yeah. real filmmaking. And then not just to green light the script, but to back it with all of the studio resources on a level today that we would only associate with superhero movies, it's um, it's it was a better it was a better filmmaking world. Yeah, it really was, and it's interesting how if you take I guess this is probably true of any movie, but if you take any of these major players away from the equation, you obviously don't have the Chinatown that we know today, uh, and and which brings me to Polanski because. I, I I like how you emphasize early on in the book about the the effects of the the Manson murders, and obviously Polanski was more gravely affected by this than anyone, um, because that I feel really infuses itself into the marrow of that movie Chinatown. I think so too. I think so too. Pol Polanski, you know, people forget. Um, how much Polanski has suffered. I know we're not allowed to say that, but <laughs> I'm saying it. Um, he has suffered and he has created suffering. Mm. Um, and um, only, only a, 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 a filmmaker who, who really understands Chinatown level proportions of grief and futility could bring them to the screen. Um, yeah. um, so, you know, without Polanski, this, this movie simply could not be as great as it, as it was. Uh, it would be a different movie and it's hard to imagine it would be a better, a better movie. Yeah. The, the, you alluded to it earlier. What, what was the original ending? Oh God, the original ending was, was, um, a little more, uh, bittersweet. Um, it wasn't total annihilation. I believe, oh God, I always forget this. They always ask me in interviews. I believe the Faye Dunaway character um, gets away with the girl. She saves the girl. Uh, I'm not. Sh I'm not sure. I can see that. I can see the hate comments piling up. No, no, no. Uh, I, I mean, I, I, in general, I think that's absolutely right. And and I and, think that's what it was. And Roman, you know, he knew that. That doesn't really that doesn't really happen. The reality he knew was that the the girl doesn't always get saved in the end. Yeah, yeah, uh, you know, and, and Town thought that Roman's ending was was uncompromisingly bleak, and um, Roman thought, well, wait a second, how does the meta metaphor of Chinatown work if it isn't uncompromisingly bleak? Mm. Um, and uh, Town said, well, no, the the metaphor it's still pretty futile, you know. Uh, uh, if the bad guy gets away, you know, um, um, it's, and the crime is perpetuated, which is also part of the original ending, is that um, the bad guy is, is is celebrated for his work, and the work goes on, you know, for for his first crimes, mm. which <clears throat> is really the story of history, celebrating crimes, um, people not knowing the actual truth of how things got to be the way that they are. So, so, so often we're celebrating crimes, you know, we don't know the blood that was spilled to get us to where we are. Um, and that's part of what town was, was writing about. So he felt that Chinatown, the metaphor was preserved in intact. And, um, but, but 
I think the point is made better by Romans inter- with Romans interpretation. Yeah, I think so too. Were you able to spend time speaking with Roman? Yes, uh, yes, I, I did, I did. It, it's terrific and, and and insightful and 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 shed light into technical corners that um, he hadn't discussed before. And then you have you have Nicholson. And I forget I forget who said it. It might have been Evans. Uh, but this really feels like his first adult, uh, kind of fully mature role. Um, what do you think Nicholson as leading man brings to that movie? Well, I, I don't think it's a, his first mature role. It's certainly his first um, leading man role on, on the scale, uh, on, the, on the A picture scale. Um, you know, was he a leading man in five easy pieces? Um, I think you could say so, but um, when the time the time that town started writing this um, that that hadn't come out yet, um, but um, uh, yeah, in, in in a traditional leading man sense, um, this was Nicholson's big big breakthrough, and also you know you can't underplay the fact that this was a leading man part in the form of a major Hollywood genre, the detective movie. <clears throat> um, Five Easy Pieces was not so comfortably encased in Hollywood genre. Uh, in fact, it really wasn't. That's part of what makes it cool. So, so, so placing Nicholson in that continuum, you know, alongside Bogart, say, you yeah. know, um, really does formally announce him as a star on the grandest, biggest scale. Yeah. And he felt so, I mean, Nicholson, just the, the persona, he felt so uh, modern uh, at that time. So it, it, it's so interesting to place him in a 30s throwback role and to see what kind of freshness he could bring to it. Um, and there's also something about Nicholson where the kind of male he specialized in at that time, there was some... Um, I don't quite know how to describe it, but it, I think it started with Five Easy Pieces, this this kind of rootless, wandering uh, male. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It, impotent, impotent, but but rageful, you know. Uh, yeah. and, and I think that a lot of people in America felt that and feel that. That's a that's a common feeling. Um, you know, Jack's. Jack's a little guy with with big guy energy, and that uh, that's kind of the human condition, isn't it? We're all little guys with 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 big energy. Yeah. Um, what do we do with that energy? You, can we fight Nurse Ratchet? Can we fight Chinatown? Um, uh, you know, the last detail. You know, yeah. uh, it's 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 the same guy. Um, how do we break it? And and um, the um, character he played in Easy Rider. How do mm. we break out of the system? Jack is always dealing with that that um, thwarted resistance. Right, right. Yeah, you that's know? A, that's exactly it. Yeah. <clears throat> and then with um, another major player in the film is obviously uh, John Houston. Uh, yeah. Which I can't. You know what a. Just the, the, I know. the the presence of John Houston. Yeah, like, yeah. My God, yeah. that had to have been a first choice, or that did that. Yeah, part- that was Ro- that was Roman's. I'm pretty sure that was Roman's first choice. Yeah, he saw it when he was reading the script. That's a pretty, that's a pretty brilliant piece of casting. I mean, that that is it would not have been anyone's first choice except for a guy as imaginative as as Roman Polanski would not have been the obvious the obvious choice but again looking back you know it's that that gesture of originality that in retrospect seems obvious uh but really wasn't obvious as a sign of a real real um real great powerful creativity yeah and we were talking about evil earlier and uh you know Houston and his presence uh 
it kind of sh- it, 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 it in no way attempts to sentimentalize him. But, no, but no, it, it certainly doesn't. It does show how terrible a person he is, but also just because it's Houston, it's coming from that great bellowing voice. It's very allure, yep, yep. alluring at the same time. Oh yeah, it's amazing. Uh, the, the portrayal of of women, the the femme fatale. Uh, what, yeah. do you, what do you feel is unique about how Faye Dunaway inhabits that characterization? Well, I don't know if it's unique. It's ter- it's terrific. I mean, she's a ter- she's terrific in that in that movie. She gets all attention and neurosis, and um, and conflict um, of being drawn to this man, but also being scared of of intimacy. Um, she 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 got it. I mean, what 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 was interesting um, about Town's approach, which was counterintuitive to, as far as the genre goes, was that he wanted um, to reverse the paradigm of the femme fatale and write a character who started off suspicious, but, again, but in the end became virtuous, as opposed to the traditional femme fatale who starts off seeming virtuous, but then is revealed to be dangerous. Mm. Um, so he just, he just, he reversed the order very, very intelligently, very conscientiously. Um, but I, I don't know if Faye's portrayal was, uh, uh, it's just terrific. It's just, she just gets what this woman is about and, 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 and finds so many ways to play so many conflicting moods and emotions, you know, um, it's a t- terrific, terrific part. Um, definitely my f- my favorite performance in the movie. I mean, well, Houston uh, and and Faye Dunaway, I guess. Yeah, the the L.A. <clears throat> that's portrayed in Chinatown. It's one of those movies where it feels so totally prescient to the time it was made, and yet it has great. Uh, it, it really conforms to the the look of the 1930s. I mean, it. Uh, I last time I was in LA, I went to visit some Chinatown locations, and oh. uh, a lot more of them are out there than that I would have expected. A lot of the houses and yeah, stuff. Yeah, uh, that's true. And I, I stood in that in that alleyway where Nicholson gives that great line that uh, I like my nose, I like breathing out of it, yeah. and I still think you're hiding something, which I think is one of yeah. the great noir lines <laughs> ever. Uh, it is pretty cute, isn't it? That yeah, one? yeah. Tell me about the the what you discovered about the, the the task of recreating that period in the the Los Angeles that they wanted to portray. Well, that's really owed in part uh, largely to um, the location scouting of the production designer Richard Silbert and assistant director uh, Howard Koch Jr. Now Hawk Koch. Um, wanting to pick locations that felt that that were sort of um, quietly of the period. They did not want to shove the period down your throat. Um, they really wanted to let the period be in the background. Uh, and, and I think that's partly why the movie does feel so of the period, because mm. it's, they're, they're taking the period for granted, the way we would take uh, the period for granted if we were shooting a movie today. Um, and so that that is a, a, that I think was a real, a sophisticated choice, um, and uh, that's that's this d- to due to Richard Silbert, Hawk, and Thea Silbert, a costume designer, um, the subtlety of those designs, um, and uh, I, 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 I there's there's hardly a better. There's hardly a better use of period in a Hollywood movie. I mean, nothing, nothing exceeds it. I mean, I can only think of something that that matches it. Yeah, it does feel fully kind of organic and lived in. Yeah, Yeah. organic. Right. That's right. That's right. Uh, Was was the movie? I I know for certain it was it was critically uh, embraced and embraced by the, the various awards and things. Which I say various awards. There weren't really various awards back then, like there are now. But um, did the audience embrace it? Um, yeah, yeah. For, for for the most part, yeah. I mean, this was not a this was not a hit. Um, it was certainly a certainly a success. 
um, not a giant success, but you know our idea of what a success means in today is very different than what a success meant then. Um, you know, uh, it's a three million dollar movie, so um, it, 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 the, the bar, the financial bar, is not so high. Um, today, you know, to make a success, movies are hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, it's 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 basic. It's pornographic. Um, but here, they made a work of art for three million dollars, mm. uh, which isn't to say it was a it was a small amount of money. It it but you know, like every art, it was a risk. Um, so it's hard to characterize the degree of the success. Easier to say that that the critics, for the most part. Uh, were, were really loved the movie instantly. Pauline Kael didn't. The the public uh, the public you know for the most part embraced it also. Yeah, I just happened to think I love reading Pauline Kael, and I don't remember ever reading a review she did for Chinatown. So she was she was negative on it. She was negative. She was negative on it. She thought it was just. She just thought it was too bleak. Um, I I don't really know how. I, 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 I love Pauline. I have to disagree with her there. Yeah. Um, it wasn't trashy. Um, it wasn't the, trashy enough. <laughs> it wasn't trashy enough for Pauline. <laughs> yeah, exactly. that's a good point. That's a good point. You know, maybe it was too elegant for her. Um, I, I don't know. That's so interesting. I, yeah, um, I, I don't know. You know, I love reading Pauline Kael, and and whenever I read Pauline Kael, it reminds me of of how how much people today don't understand the role of criticism. It's not so someone will echo your feelings about a movie. It's so that you could be challenged by somebody else's feelings that don't run parallel to yours. And she had... Well, she, that's right. She had such a way of just making her opinion so vivid, you know. Well, also, the movies were up to it. Yeah. The, the, movies, the movies were worth having opinions about. Um, the movies they ha that that come out today in Hollywood, what could one's opinion be other than I had a good time or I didn't have a good time? Mm, mm. Yeah. It it they don't warrant investigation. They 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 fall apart. They don't need critics. Um, and in fact, the box office proves that they don't need critics. Um, uh, wh whereas Pauline could open and close a movie um, the way Ben Brantley can on Broadway, mm. when we had Broadway, Broadway, um, the critics now uh, they 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 don't they don't mean anything. And and, and uh, for box office in turn, and and you know um, it's it's people. If anything, they look at Rotten Tomatoes, um, and they see the aggregate of a lot of people who are not really as qualified as Pauline Kael. A lot of them are, but a lot of them aren't. Yeah. Um, uh, there is such a thing as a professional opinion and an expert opinion, and the whole notion of expertise has been has been challenged. Yeah, now. and I, I know, think... People I th feel that... Yeah, go I, ahead. I think the main ingredient is that uh, what I find is... I mean, you could comment that the cinematography was excellent, the performances, blah, 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 but that's not really... What 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 entices me about a well reasoned review is an examination of what is this movie really about. There's the plot, but that's not always what a movie is about. And I don't think enough people question. And you're right, they don't make movies of that caliber. That you know, the movies of today are too shallow to really go in depth of what a movie is really trying to say. Uh, yeah, and they're not challenging our tastes. You know, I mean, a, a, a lot of times you look for a critic to say, you know, here's maybe why the, this didn't taste so good to you. Mm. Here's, here's, here's why this is of the, from the future. You know, great, great art is kind of of the future in that way. It's new. So it doesn't always taste like we're used to. And, and, and a, a great critic can help bridge that gap. Um, you know, like your parents with, you know, when you didn't like the taste of sushi the first time you had it, and, and you know, your parents said, well, you know, maybe this, this and that, and you get used to it, and what about this, and, you know, try that, and give it a chance, you know, that's, that's kind of what you want a, a critic to do. And on the other side, you know, bash cliche and lies, um, uh, um, which, which Pauline 
did to the best of her ability. Mm. Uh, you know, and uh, this is a big part of what your book is about, as you alluded to earlier. It's that they, the, the Hollywood has changed, or the filmmaking industry has changed so much that you can't imagine a movie like Chinatown being made today. I mean, just merely the fact that the lead actor... Oh, there's no, there's no way. ...was yeah, a yeah, ba- go ahead. Band- yeah. bandage covering his face through half the movie. <laughs> that would not fly. Well, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that yeah, they, that would not fly. So you see this as a that big kind of de- demarcation, I, I don't know how to express it, demarcation point? Like, the, the do you f- see Chinatown as the last of a certain breed? Well, I, it's certainly one of the last of a certain breed. I, I, I don't want to say it's the, you know, it's the last. Um, 1974-75 was, as I see it, the, uh, um, the, the transition point. Um, from the golden era to, you know, the bronze. And Chinatown was amongst the last of that, of that golden era. Mm. Uh, what do you think? Do you think watching the movie today, do you think we can see something new in it that maybe we didn't see 45 years ago or however long it was? I don't think so. I mean, I think that that people have been seeing, have been celebrating Chinatown, um, you know, uh, pretty consistently for forty years. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, so I, I I can't say that even I see anything in it um, uh, that that hasn't been seen before. It's it's not a it's not a cult classic. This movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's an American classic. Um, so, uh, no, I don't think there's anything new to see except how enduring this metaphor is, um, uh, that Chinatown is an American nightmare and, and perhaps that's part of why the movie survives so much. I mean, it can't just be the craft. There has to be something emotional going on and, and, um, I think if anyone were to revisit it today, they would certainly say, wow, this movie seems to have been made today. It's so relevant. Yeah. And I, yeah. And I think that what I try to describe the appeal of Chinatown for me, I mean, a lot of it feels uh, intangible. It's like, how, how can you describe how music moves you? It's just there's something well, yeah, yeah. there's something in the character of the film the time in which it was made so infused itself in that film that you can you can feel it uh it's hard to to talk about isn't it music music is hard to talk about and and it's good you brought that up because i think that's one of the greatest things about chinatown is jerry goldsmith score which was the greatest scores of all time i one of my favorite scores i should say absolutely and wasn't that a last minute kind of addition to the project yeah, it, yeah, sure was. The um, the first, the original score was a little more uh, was was more uh, was avant garde and um, scrapped. Robert Evans was, I think, very right to want something more um, e- romantic. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's so so integral integral to the to the success of the movie. Can I ask you about yeah. one other movie that has nothing to do with Chinatown or this period of filmmaking? Sure. I've always wanted to talk to you about this movie because I find it fas- a fascinating movie and it's one of my favorites and yet my uh, I think it's one of my favorites because I'm so conflicted about it and that's Star 80. Uh Oh, Bob Fosse's last film. Yeah. Uh I love Star 80. I do too. And but, the, but there are elements of it where I'm thinking, you know, the movie is so uh uh, the movie itself identifies so strongly with the Paul Snyder character. Yes. Uh, and there, I, I, and I'm not quite sure is it saying that that what Snyder is uh, is kind of like a uh, the logical extension of what Playboy, the Playboy image uh, portrays. Uh, I don't know if I'm comfortable with that kind of. Uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff that I'm conflicted about with the movie, and yet it's for that reason that I'm so attracted to it. Well, yeah, why do you have to be comfortable for it to be good? Right. Right. In fact, if you are comfortable, it's probably because you've seen it before. I I would think, you know. I seek out discomfort. Um, 
for that reason, you know, artful discomfort. I don't want to just see. Yeah. Ex- I don't want to see exploitation. Uh, that's interesting to me. Um, but you want art to expand, expand your levels of comfort and discomfort. It expands your your experience, uh, and all you have to do is just sit down and watch. Yeah, and it is interesting. So I think it's a very brave movie. I think yes. it is too, absolutely. And I think that it, we talked about Polanski earlier and the fact that many of his demons come to the forefront in a lot of his works, but particularly Chinatown. Fosse was another artist that kind of, he was exercising demons. He was working them out in his movies, uh, which is what makes all him so great appealing artists to me. Are exercising, all great artists are, are putting all of themselves into a movie and and that includes their you know their demons yeah, um we, that's we, what makes them great we just had a long conversation about uh because i'm doing this series about the films of 1970 and we just had a long conversation about peckinpah who was definitely another film like filmmaker in that wheelhouse yeah um, what did you, when you were researching your Fosse book, what did you discover about Star 80 that uh, was particularly illuminating to your treatment of that film in the book? Well, that this is a movie that that um, Bob Fosse, uh, uh, you know, that, that that all Bob Fosse was doing was making different versions of his biography, and each one more uncompromising than the last each one more merciless than the last and this is one of the most uncompromising movies ever released by a major hollywood studio and uh uh i think for that reason it is incredibly courageous incredibly courageous of fossey to implicate himself um in in a look in a look at that kind of desperation and madness um and he certainly understood it, and uh, the degree to which he understood it uh, I, was uh, astonishing to me as I looked closer at it and see how much he lived that part, and Eric Roberts lived that part, and how the whole crew was haunted by that pathology that was swimming around the set. Um, uh, I I gained... I gained even more respect for that movie. Although I'm certainly not calling over my friends and ordering a pizza and putting on Star 80. <laughs> uh, I, although knowing my friends, you know that they might actually enjoy that. Um, uh, um, yeah, it's it's one of those movies uh, I'm almost afraid to recommend to some people I, I, because they'll look at me much differently after I. Uh, but uh, the other th- interesting thing about that movie for me is that. Uh, uh, the last time I watched it, I try to watch it once every year or so. Uh, Mariel Hemingway really came to the forefront for me, and I, I thought she gave a lovely performance. But, you know, for the longest time, I thought the criticism that, you know, it's clearly empathetic, empathetic might be too strong. Well, it is with Paul Snyder uh, and and Stratton is kind of in the background. Uh, I I thought that, you know, that's kind of the point. Well, how do you humanize? Can our 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 where is the humanity in someone who does something unthinkably evil? Um, that is not a, a theme that's new to Bob Fosse. Yeah. Um, that goes back to the beginning of time. I mean, Richard the yeah. Third. I'm just picking up Shakespeare, although it pre- predates him. Um, uh, you know, I mean, how how many criminal? Uh, you know, Jimmy Cagney uh, was a killer in the movies who loved his mother. Look at me, Ma. You know, um, um, so uh, Bob Fosse didn't invent this, um, um, but he he certainly he certainly took it darker. He certainly took it. He certainly took it scarier. Yeah. Because uh, uh, the nature of the sickness of this human being uh, uh, is, is, un, is, you know, it's hard, hard to imagine that had ever been done in a major Hollywood movie. I certainly can't think of a, of a precedent. But no, it's on a continuum that's uh, that's always existed, and to to a certain extent, is part of every every 
bad guy or good guy. You know, there is always going to be a dark side. I mean, certainly Snyder is as bad as it gets. Mm. Um, but isn't is he still a human being? Uh, again, we're in a philosophical question uh, I, I, I can't answer. But, but certainly, Fosse is totally within his rights to explore that question, and yeah. we need artists to do that. I can, I can recognize the humanity in him in the movie. I recognize where that uh, comes from. Obviously, it's, it's taken to an extreme level. But, you know, I think a lot of things just generate from pure human need. Uh, and the desperation inherent in that, and uh, and yeah, and that's where Fosse was with it, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and, and that's an offensive uh, notion to some people, you yes. know. Uh, and, and 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 I understand. I understand why um, artists artists got to be free. Yeah. So your next book, I heard that it's about zoetrope. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's an exciting Correct. subject. <laughs> Correct. It certainly is to me. So to me, it's the most ambitious project in, you know, since the founding of Hollywood. I guess the most ambitious filmmaking project since the founding of Hollywood. Is is Zotrope, Is does it still exist or? It still exists. It you know it cha- it changes form. It 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 dies and then rises again. Um, uh, it, it still exists and it's it's run by Sophia uh, and uh, Roman Coppola. Right. Um, but they, they focus most of their attention on their film on their filmmaking. But I'm I'm going to be writing about the period that starts in the late '60s with Lucas and Coppola, Murch and uh, um, oh. Carol Ballard, you know those guys, and um, certainly bring it up to date to the present. That's such a fertile fertile period of time. I hope so. Oh. I'm glad you think so. Well, I know so. <laughs> I can't. I'm, I'm first in line to buy that book. I mean, it's right up my oh, alley. Oh, good. Yeah. And the good. S- San Francisco film culture. The All that. Uh, all that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you Here find... we are going back to the 70s. Well, that, um, do, do you find... That's where my mind goes to. Um, and I, I think to myself, am but, I just ro- romanticizing the past? There's a good reason for that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, do you feel uh, when you're writing this, th- these books, do, do you feel a mission to kind of keep this period of um, American cinema alive? I I really do. Yeah. I really do. For me, it is a uh, yeah. And I think everyone who loves movies feels that feels that way. I'm lucky that I get to do it for a living. And you do it so well. Uh, I mean, you're you thank you're, God, you're, thank you. Your writing is beautiful. Thank you. I so appreciate you giving me time. Uh, to talk today, I, I really admire what you do. Thank you. You make it a you make it a pleasure, and thank you for bringing this. <laughs> thank you for bringing quality to the world.